So if I asked you, which was the first kind of place you'd start, physicist or origami? And I said, physicist or origami, would you believe me? We'll stick around and hear from the Dr. Robert Lang. That's right, Scott. Today on our show, we have Dr. Robert Lang with us. He is an origami expert, and he connects it to mathematics. And he is creating all kinds of uh, solutions for problems in our world through the art of folding. Is that right, Dr. Lang? That's a fair assumption. Pretty good description. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I do both, I do both art and solutions. Um, the thing that ties them together is origami. I've been folding origami for uh, nearly 50 years, ever since I was a kid. Got into it kind of the same way other kids probably do, to find some instructions, fold it because it's a fun thing to do, pass the time, way to make toys. Uh, and it became a passion that I've been really interested in my whole life. Uh, it wasn't my job. My job uh, was uh, laser physics. I studied engineering and lasers in college and worked for about 15 years uh, doing research and development on lasers and optoelectronics. But I've always had this interest and passion for origami and pretty early in my technical career I started trying to use the tools I'd learned in technology, math and, uh, and the like, to describe origami with the goal of helping me fold better art to create be able to create from paper the visions and objects that I wanted to create. And math helped me do that. But it also turned out that, perhaps not surprisingly, the math that you can use to design origami art also lets you design origami for technological reasons. Uh, making things that unfold and deploy, things like solar arrays, telescopes, uh, medical implants, packaging. And so about 16 years ago, I quit my job doing lasers to devote my life full time to origami. And it's been a pretty even mix of art, developing new folding designs, teaching people how to design origami, and technology, consulting on applications of origami to product design, and also investigating the mathematical underpinnings of origami, so developing the theory that will allow us to continue to push the state of the art in both art and technology. Dr. Lang, I am so thrilled to have you on because I feel like you dispel this myth that math and art are separate. And I feel like this is a common myth out there and that you either have a math mind or like this artistic creative mind and you've, you meld those together. Um, have you always had a passion for art and then math came along or was it a dual passion and kind of talk to us about a little bit of how that developed and, and just talk about that. And the connection. Yeah, it was yeah. A, a dual passion. And as a kid, um, the thing that was appealing about origami was it was a way to be creative, to make things. And, you know, the, the desire to, to make things and to create motivates artists. But that exact same desire motivates engineers. Hmm. So you find the same, so I don't think you'd say, oh, there's an art mind, there's an engineer mind. There is a desire to create mind. And that mind can go different places. Some do just art, some just engineering. Fair number of people do both. And similarly for, for mathematics, um, math is math is fundamentally the study of patterns and relationships. You know, the math we learn in school, we think, oh, it's all about manipulating numbers or in algebra, manipulating letters. But but, but that's not real, those are the tools of math, but that's not really what math is about. Math is about discovering patterns and relationships that, sure, start with numbers, but also go into 
areas that, that don't look much like school math, things like uh, structure and surfaces and uh, you know, the, this whole field of topology that really doesn't have any particular, uh, you're not measuring any numbers, you're looking at how things are connected to themselves and others. So once again, an interest in pursuing patterns, relationships, beautiful forms is something that drives some people into math, some people into art, and quite a few people do both. There are a lot of mathematical mathematicians who do art and a certain number of artists who also do math. Now, are, are you, uh, hang on a second here. I gotta get my thoughts together. <laughs> You're blowing my mind. Yeah. There's so things yeah. that are spinning in my head right now. I have so many questions too. I just, uh, I'm dying. I, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna jump in here, Tim, sorry. Like, as you were um, talking, I had like 10 of them going in my head. I gotta take notes. <laughs> do doctor, like, are we doing math wrong then with kids? When we have kindergartners doing worksheets with one plus two, are, are we doing this wrong? in education, should we have them doing a lot more hands-on pattern connecting, uh, folding, cutting, whatever it might be that develops that perspective of identifying patterns rather than just these number, you know, algorithms? Well, I'd say there is plenty of room for improvement in mathematical education. We, they do need, you do need to learn the, the the basic tools you know you need to be able to do arithmetic um, if only to un, to be able to appreciate for deeper concepts about numbers um, so I mean we, we you do need to learn the tools but I think there is a lot more there are a lot more ways that people can learn and be excited um, and be motivated and we need to try more diverse learning strategies. Um, so for, for many kids, um, they, a lot of kids need or benefit from having tangible references, uh, physical objects. You know, when we teach things like geometry and we draw lines on a chalkboard, um, some kids can get that. They can do the abstraction in their mind to understand you're not really telling them about chalk marks on a on a green surface or a you know or I guess ink marks on a white surface that there is a concept uh, behind that that all these lines on the board represent we're trying to teach them about the concept some kids get it from that some don't but for some by manipulating physical objects um, might even be paper folding that 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 manipulation gives them a clear idea of some of these concepts than uh, just making you know, marks on a chalkboard or seeing lines printed in a book. And I think we do, uh, because of this emphasis on, uh, on testing um, and teaching to the test, I think there, that doesn't permit the freedom to explore other ways of conveying the concepts, and the, many of those other ways would bring in, um, I think, bring more people into math and and make it less scary for the ones who say, you know, oh, I'm I'm, I'm no good at math. I'm, I'm I'm scared of math. You know, or, or things like that. So yeah, I think there are things we can do better. Excellent. Let me ask you this. Let's say you uh, were dubbed king of education tomorrow and you could uh, tell all the teachers of the United States and other parts of the world too, Canada and other places uh, that you could actually talk to and explain to them. What would you have these teachers, what would you have teachers do in their classrooms that would be different than perhaps what your experience was going through school? What would you like everybody, I mean, would you have everybody doing an origami lesson every once in a while? Or, or what would you just hope to see happening, like a specific thing happening in our schools today? More recreational math. And perhaps it's parochial of me to say that because that was my pathway into the world of math and technology. 
it, I didn't get excited by math from my school classes. I definitely learned important tools through my school classes, but the thing that excited me was recreational mathematics, and specifically um, the books and articles by uh, Martin Gardner, who was a great popularizer, a writer of math. And in fact, I, it's likely that his articles through the 25 years he wrote for Scientific American inspired an entire generation of people into mathematics and technology. So what um, that origami falls in that category. So I wouldn't say just do origami. I'd say do a lot of different recreational math puzzles. Spend a day a week. Uh, you know, spend four days a week on your standard curriculum, but spend a day a week doing interesting, fun math puzzles and kind of exploring how those get solved, how you fit differently, the way of problem solving and thinking in, in mathematical terms. I think that would have great benefit. So the holding, cutting, perhaps uh, Sudoku, things like that, like logic puzzles, is that what you're thinking? Or... I'm just trying to get, you know, wraps, put some meat on it. Like, what would that look like? I can picture the origami. Like, do you have any other examples of the kinds of things that you're talking about? Oh, um, nothing I'd come up with right off the top of my head. Okay. I'd have to go kind of flip through and pull yeah. out some examples. But the things you named, um, you know, a little bit of Sudoku is good. Sudoku is actually not about numbers and the numbers are just symbols yeah. so it's really about groupings and patterns yeah um, yes. and so things I'd say more things like that polyhedra um, you know what kind of shapes can you make uh, from combining polygons into 3d solids what are some of the patterns and regularities are there relationships between the the number of corners the number of edges the number of faces um, Things like, uh, you know, uh, graph theory, which is a very mathematical field, has nothing to do with numbers, was initiated from a, a puzzle um, in the city of Königsberg. Can you cross all the bridges in the city without crossing any bridge more than once? Uh, and uh, that was a puzzle, and solving that puzzle led to a new field of math. And kids can solve that kind of puzzle. And they can actually, I think even young kids can understand mathematical concepts like graphs, coloring, things like that. Yeah, that reminds me of Flow. Have you seen the, the iPad game Flow? No. It's like a bunch of colored dots on a grid and you have to connect the, the like colored dots with each other. And you have to figure out paths and how they, you know, cannot, they can't intersect each other and things like that. So that kind of spatial reasoning things that would be good for kids, right? Yep. So, um, Dr. Lane, can you make a, a deep connection for us and the audience between origami and math? And I mean, is it just the patterns or is there something more that, you know, teachers can use within the classroom? Is it measurement? Is it angle? Is it all of the above? Is it that and, and, and more? Well, th there's, um, there are, deep mathematical connections to the world of origami because there are principles in origami that, that seem really basic, um, such as if you take two points on a sheet of paper, make a dot, make two dots on a sheet of paper, and then you fold that paper in, in some way and you measure the distance between the two dots after folding. The distance after folding is always the same or smaller than the distance you started with. There's no way you could fold the paper that would make those two dots get farther apart, no matter how you folded it. So that's, and that's true for any set of dots, any piece of paper. So it's kind of a universal law. Now I just used a lot of words to describe that law, but there's a mathematical way of describing it very concisely. And once, so when you put laws like that in mathematical terms, then you can start to use the tools of mathematics that mathematicians have worked out over the past hundreds, several hundreds of years to 
to analyze those laws and to discover what's possible, what's not, and give guidance on how to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. So that's, that's a connection from math to origami, and that's those types of connections are what enable people to study, to, or excuse me, to accomplish new designs in the world of origami. Now, for classroom use to explore, uh, to explore these connections, there's a couple of really good books. Um, pr probably one of the best I'm going to recommend is uh, called Project Origami. It's by a mathematician named Tom Hull. And it explores a lot of the mathematical connections underpinning origami. So it's a way people can start to, 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 to learn the math that's related to origami and, and vice versa. Yeah, origami is fun too, man. It's so motivating. I, I don't know if Scott remembers this because uh, I'm much older than he is. I'm an old man. But uh, we had some Japanese uh, foreign exchange, like a gal that came over to teach, another one that was like a student at the college. And uh, you remember Senosan? Yeah. <laughs> and I remember learning origami from at least one of them. This it was, is it was a long time ago. And uh, just like developing that love for like, wow, you can take that little square piece of paper and all of a sudden you end up with this cool, you know, 3D model. It's just amazing. So um, I can see why you, you've been excited about it and how we can get the kids excited about math modeling and uh, spatial reasoning and everything through the use of origami. So it's a great idea. All right, uh, if it's okay with you, we're gonna switch gears now. Uh, so many things we could ask you about, uh, but we're gonna play a little game with you right now. And uh, we know that you're an expert on paper folding. And there's another artist that uh, was not a, a physical artist, but a musical artist that told us that we gotta know when to fold them. You know who I'm talking about? Oh, uh, I know the lyrics. Um, Kenny Rogers. There you go, Kenny Rogers. So we're going to play a little game with you today that we're calling uh, you got to know when to fold them. And uh, Scott, why don't you tell our audience who Dr. Lang is going to be competing for today? Dr. Lang, you're going to be competing for Kim Hewitt, a fourth and fifth grade loop teacher, Tim, you like that, in Sacramento, California. If you're able to answer two out of three questions correctly, Kim will be awarded a free download of an album by the ridiculously popular edgy rock band, Rockin' the Standards. So, right. Dr. Lang, are you, are you a Kenny Rogers fan by any chance? Not at all, but uh, I used to hear it on the radio. Yeah, me too, me too. Not a big Kenny Rogers fan, but uh, he does know about folding, so. I think uh, any, even a Kenny Rogers fan would have to guess at these questions, Tim. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, here we go with question number one. Kenny Rogers is, of course, best known for his singing fame, but before he was a singer, Kenny Rogers was actually a professional athlete. Did you know that? That's pretty nope. crazy. Which sport? Which sport did Kenny complete, compete in? Is it A? Golf. B? <laughs> tennis. Or C? Baseball. So those are your three choices. Was he a professional golfer, tennis player, or baseball player? No idea. So I'm just going to go with baseball. Well, that would be a, a good guess, but unfortunately, it's wrong. Okay, so he was actually a tennis player. And uh, you can actually look him up online. He does have a, uh, what, what do they call that? The tennis ranking. He's got some sort of a, you know, listing in the, the professional tennis thing. I think he had like one tournament that he was in or something. So, all right. Well, you got two more chances. And second up, we have Kenny Rogers was once roommates with another famous musician. He discovered and produced an album with which one of these famous rockers before they became big time? Is it A... John Henley of the Eagles, which, by the way, Dr. Lang, can you fold an eagle? Um, yes, I can fold an eagle. Have, okay. Have done awesome. so several times. Awesome. Or is it uh, B? David Bowie. Or C? Peter Gabriel of Genesis. Well, once again, since, as I said at the outset, I know nothing about Kenny Rogers, 
Um, I wouldn't know this one either, so I'll just pick one. Don Henley. Don Henley. I think that's a good Yes. Okay. Well, you got that one right. Don Henley. He was, uh, yeah, discovered him and produced an album with him. Kind of interesting. Okay, question number three. He's actually, Kenny Rogers is actually a big fan of a website where someone mocks him on the website, kind of somewhat mocking him. It was voted one of the top 100 web websites of all time on Yahoo. What is the name of this website? Is it A? Men who look like Kenny Rogers .com. Or is it B? I want to be Kenny Rogers next wife .com. I wait, I don't want to be his next wife. No, no, that's the name of the website. Or oh, is okay. it or is it C? Kenny loves Dolly .com. Kenny oh, I guess he loves Dolly. Kenny loves Dolly .com. Well, he I think he's loved a lot of people. He's on his fifth wife right now, but uh, <laughs> okay. So which one do you think it is? Uh, men who look like Kenny Rogers? I want to be Ken Re Kenny Rogers' next wife or Kenny loves Dolly? Well, since, uh, once again, don't know anything about the guy, but <laughs> there are a certain number of guys out there who look sort of like him. So I'm going to go with number one, men who look like Kenny. Good job. Yes, uh, there's actually a website called men who look like Kenny Rogers .com. I haven't been there myself. I don't know if you guys have ever gone to that website. I'm going to try to get on it someday. <laughs> Are you going to try to look like him? Yeah, why not? He's a good looking man. So, uh, Scott, how did Robert do today? Dr. Lang, you got two out of three correct, which is good enough to be a winner. All right. Congratulations. No, Dr. Lang, you won absolutely nothing. But Kim, you just won a free download of Rock and the Standards album, the educational rock and roll music for second through sixth graders. Kim, congratulations. Dr. Lang, thank you so much for playing our silly game here. And uh, we really appreciate having you on. My pleasure. And before we uh, sign off, can you tell our audience how they might be able to connect with you in the future? Uh, buy books by you? Do you have a website? Do you, are you on social media, email, anything like that that they can follow up and learn more? Yeah, to, to, for the answer to almost all of those questions is go to my website, langorigami.com, um, and you'll see a whole slew of my artwork. Um, there's also a contact page to email me. I answer all emails, so uh, they're welcome to email and ask questions. Um, and uh, if you can't remember langorigami.com, just Google Lang and Origami, and you'll find me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, you're on the Origami Masters page on Wikipedia. You're listed there, Dr. Lang, which is, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great site, and you can't believe some of these things that, that uh, Dr. Lang can make, so go right. check out the website. And, Scott, you want to remind the audience about uh, a big event that we got coming up here. Once yeah. First Wednesday of February every year is Global School Play Day. Last year and just the third year of Global School Play Day, over a quarter of a million students from 50-plus nations participated and just got chance to have that unstructured play. And origami would be a great example of what I saw some of my students doing in my class. So Global School Play Day is all about giving kids back that time that's so precious that helps them develop creativity, imagination, problem solving, social skills. It's just things that aren't happening as much in our modern world. And we want um, kids to be a part of that. It's uh, battery free, I call it, Tim. I think other people call it electronics free. But it's all just about discovery and creativity and figuring out ways just to play. Ways to get on board. On board, that's right. Globalschoolplayday.com, visit there. You can register your class. There's no fees. It's all free. It's just saying, yeah, I believe in this movement, and I, we want to join you and play on that day. And uh, why not play every day, Tim, right? That's right. It's, an un, it's a grassroots movement just to send a loud message to our culture that says playing is not a waste of time. We're actually willing to give up a school day to have our kids just do whatever they want in terms of play. And uh, that's not wasting time. They're getting an education just like when we're slapping them worksheets. In fact, better than when we're slapping them worksheets. Much better. Yes. Yeah, you slap worksheets, Tim? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was, 
they make good paper airplanes. You can make them into origami. They're great, you know. <laughs> so that would be a better use, I, I think. <laughs> definitely. Once again, Dr. Lang, thanks for coming on the show, and we hope to have you on again. You're welcome. And thanks for hey, watching. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Thanks for watching, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Mom and Dad.